In this video, I want to talk about the M1X MacBook Pros, which according to rumors are coming out very, very soon. And I wanted to talk about some of the features I really, really want them to have. Now, this video will contain some leaks. You guys know how I feel about leaks. They are pretty stupid until we actually have something that comes out and it's confirmed by Apple themselves. Don't believe anything you see or hear on the internet. But unfortunately, due to the nature of this video and the fact that none of these devices are actually out yet, I hope you guys can understand. But I mainly wanted to talk about my opinion and after 10 years of using MacBook Pros, what I would really like to see in the upcoming versions. Now, just quickly before we get into the content, this video is brought to you by Omaze. Stay tuned to find out how you can enter for a chance to win $20,000 for your ultimate gaming PC setup and how you can support a great cause called School on Wheels, helping students experiencing homelessness. Okay, so let's start with CPUs. Now I have a M1 MacBook Pro here and this bad boy has been very impressive so far. You guys have seen me test this in basically every single situation and scenario. Now this has eight cores. So you have four efficiency cores and four high performance cores. Now I have seen some rumors going around out there and also some leaks that the new M1X MacBooks later this year will feature up to 20 cores. But I think that's a little bit extreme and I don't see Apple going from eight to 20 cores in just one generation. That's quite a large jump. Now I have seen information suggesting that we're going to be seeing 12 core CPUs and they will be featuring eight high performance cores and four efficiency cores. So double the amount of high performance cores than the M1 MacBook, but that doesn't necessarily mean double the power. Now, in addition to the CPU, we also have the GPU. So you guys know with the M1 MacBook Air, there are two GPU variants. You have the seven core and the eight core. With the MacBook Pro and also the Mac Mini, you get the eight core variant, which again is already quite powerful. But I have been seeing again, more leaks and rumors pointing towards a 16 core or even a 32 core M1X MacBook Pro, which to me would be a really, really cool addition because at the moment, although the M1 Macs are super, super powerful, especially compared to other relatively entry level computers out there, it really is just lacking that raw performance and power that some other laptops can bring. Now going from eight to 16 or potentially 32 cores is gonna have a huge impact if you play games, if you do editing, or if you do any kind of 3D modeling, or even if you're an architect or you do a lot of Blender rendering, those additional GPU cores are gonna really come in clutch for you. Now cramming all of this performance into the chassis of a 14 or even 16 inch MacBook Pro, is gonna be a little bit difficult. As you guys know, especially with the Intel CPUs, just the really slim design choices that Apple makes, in particular for its 16 inch MacBook, really limits the amount of cooling and heat dissipation you can get. Now I've covered this in a previous video on the channel as to why Apple has done this. Spoiler alert, it's mainly Intel's fault, the most recent 16 inch MacBook Pro overheating issues. But I'm hoping with the upcoming MacBook Pros, the cooling is really, really efficient or the actual chips themselves are really heat efficient as well, which would be great to see. I also wouldn't mind seeing a slightly thicker chassis, especially on the 16 inch MacBook Pro compared to previous generations, because as you guys know, Apple has an obsession with making stuff super, super thin, almost to the point where it negatively impacts performance. Now, like you guys have seen with previous videos on my channel, the M1 Macs aren't exactly icebergs. Guys, they do get hot. If you're gaming or you're rendering, the CPU will get up to around 85, 90 degrees, but it doesn't seem to thermal throttle that bad, which is good to see. So I'm very, very interested to see how Apple is gonna cram all of that power into what I'm assuming is going to be a relatively thin chassis, but also keeping the cooling as good as the existing generation M1 Max. Now, when these new Apple Silicon MacBooks come out and we see what kind of performance they're packing, it's gonna be very, very interesting to compare against some of the other competing laptops out there, such as the Razer Blade 14 or the Dell XPS. By the way, guys, yes, I will be featuring some of these Windows laptops on the channel in the future, particularly when these new Macs come out, because I really do want to see how they stack up against Apple's latest version of Apple Silicon. So stay tuned for those videos. Now, moving on to a feature that I really do sorely miss, and that is, of course, MagSafe. Now, there are a couple of rumors surrounding the Mac and that MagSafe is coming back, but as much as I do want to see MagSafe, 
I don't really want Apple to just bring back the old design. So what I mean by that is, yes, I do love MagSafe, particularly at night, plugging it into a charger is very easy with MagSafe. Also, if you do knock your MacBook, for example, you're not gonna rip anything out. I love that about MagSafe, but I really do like the versatility of actually using the USB-C ports to charge the MacBook. So for me, when I go traveling, I tend to only bring one USB-C cable and that's gonna charge not only my MacBook, but all of my other USB-C accessories. But if I do actually end up losing the charger for this device or it stops working, I can just take the USB-C cable, plug it into my wall adapter or phone charger or whatever I have, and plug this bad boy in and charge it. Admittedly, it's gonna take a lot longer to charge than the normal charger, but it still works. So expanding on this, what I would love to see is some kind of hybrid MagSafe charger. So what I mean by that is you guys may have seen those third-party plug-in MagSafe chargers out there where you essentially just plug in a port into a USB-C port and that kind of allows you to do a little janky version of MagSafe. If Apple could come out with their own version for that and also have the USB-C ports on both sides like they traditionally do, that would be awesome because you can not only choose which side you want MagSafe on, you can also remove it altogether and just charge via USB-C, which is the best of both worlds. Even if they offered this little dongle or adapter separately for like 50 bucks, I would still purchase it. And I think that would be a great idea. Now staying on the topic of ports, I remember back in 2016 when Apple came out with this new design and they ended up ditching all of the ports on both sides in favor of a couple of USB-C Thunderbolt ports. Now I understand why they did it. They wanted to drive the market to actually endorse and start using USB-C more than what it had. Five years later, unfortunately, it hasn't really penetrated the market as much as I would have thought, but for me personally, I do like the flexibility of this because you can charge, you can plug monitors in, and you really only need to carry around one dongle that provides you everything you need. That being said, there's one thing I really hated about that redesign five years ago, and it is the dropping of the SD card slot. Now with this thing, you can take it pretty much anywhere with a charger and you're good to go. But if you're a photographer, a videographer, or even just someone with a GoPro on holiday, you absolutely need a dongle or some kind of adapter just to use a SD card. And for me, that's really not good because I can go without a dongle with this machine, but I have to bring one everywhere I go just for the SD card. So if Apple can reincorporate that SD card, it'd be awesome. Even better, I'm hearing rumors that it's gonna be UHS-2, which basically means that you can put SD cards there and read and write up to around 300 megabits per second, which is quite fast. Although bear in mind, you need a compatible SD card for that that can actually keep up with that speed to get the full benefits of that type of slot. Now, in terms of the screen, I would love to see mini LED technology incorporated. So having a mini LED screen on this is gonna mean your battery is gonna last longer and the overall viewing experience of the screen is going to be superior than the previous Retina display. Now, for me personally, I don't really care about mini LED. If I have to choose one of these features to drop, it would be mini LED for two reasons. Number one, I've tried mini LED in contrast with a retina screen with the new M1 iPad Pro. I really didn't notice that much of a difference. The only scenarios where you will notice a massive difference is in content consumption. So if you're gaming, for example, the colors are really bright and vivid and the blacks are really dark, or if you're consuming media, so a movie, for example, it's gonna look great. But for just general day-to-day -day tasks like email browsing, Word documents, web browsing, you're not gonna notice a difference, but of course it will conserve battery life better than the retina display could. Now, reason number two is that it's going to be relatively expensive. So that's probably going to bump up the cost of this machine, or at least Apple will keep the price the same as it traditionally was, but cut back on some of the other specs like the webcam or maybe even the keyboard, for example. Now, as we all know, we've had the retina screens for almost a decade at this point, and that means that Apple has been able to establish a huge economy of scale for those screens. And what I mean by that is they've been mass produced in such high numbers for the last eight to nine years that they are relatively cheap. 
Mini LED technology is relatively new for Apple. Now I say new, it's been around for a while. Other companies use it. But as you guys know, Apple is generally pretty slow to the party. So they quite haven't developed the economies of scale needed to reduce the price of implementing mini LED screens. Now that's just my opinion, it might be different. No one really knows apart from Apple. Now, one other thing Apple should start doing is actually removing the touch bar. So as you guys can see, this one has a touch bar there. I have mixed feelings about the touch bar. Personally, I don't like it because a lot of the time with my MacBook, I'll be sort of lying on a couch or lying on the bed and I'll be typing on it like this and I can't actually see the touch bar at all. And if I wanna change the volume or the screen brightness, it's just such a pain in the ass compared to buttons. I know a lot of people really do love the touch bar and it does have its pros. For example, when you're editing, there are shortcuts or when you're web browsing, you can bookmark things there. Definitely, you know, I'm not trashing the touch bar, but I think overwhelmingly, the vast majority of people don't like it. So again, I just think it's smart business practices for Apple to just remove it at this point and just add back the top row of function keys. Now, just before I end the video, I wanted to give you guys a quick message from Omaze that I mentioned at the start of this video. I'm very excited to announce that Omaze is giving you the chance to win $20,000 to upgrade your home PC setup. All you have to do is go to omaze.com slash created tech and enter for your chance to win. Whether you use your PC for gaming, work from home, or even graphic design, you can buy a new rig or build it from the ground up. Spoil yourself with top of the line monitors, headsets, accessories, and more. Taxes and shipping are included and even better, every donation benefits a great cause. School on Wheels, which provides free tutoring and mentoring to children from kindergarten to grade 12 experiencing homelessness. So for a chance to win $20,000 and support School on Wheels, go to omaze.com slash created tech. Thanks for watching the video and I'll catch you in the next one.